Good morning, everybody. It is at 7 o'clock. You are very welcome to join us here on The Breakfast Show, wherever you're watching us around the world. Alarming news this morning from Heathrow. Counter-terror police have launched a major investigation after uranium was discovered in a package at the airport. There are reports this morning that undeclared nuclear material arrived on a flight from Oman and was destined for Iranian nationals in the UK. Also ahead, 25,000 ambulance drivers, paramedics and call handlers are on strike. We'll be live on a picket line and we'll be speaking to the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, in just a few moments' time. It is Wednesday the 11th of January. Here at Heathrow Airport, counter-terror police are working to trace everyone who could have been involved in shipping uranium to the UK. I'm on the picket line in Huddersfield, where union leaders say they are providing life and limb cover, but NHS bosses warn that the service will struggle to cope. Also ahead, Westminster's next big scandal. Sky News reveals concerns about tens of millions flowing into the all-party parliamentary groups, much of it from lobbyists. At least 17 people are dead and tens of thousands told to leave their homes as storms batter California. In his latest television interview in the US, Prince Harry accuses the media of lying for what he said in his book about killing Taliban. Without doubt, the most dangerous lie that they have told is that I somehow boasted about the number of people that I killed in Afghanistan. Coming up later, we'll be speaking to the team of scientists who've developed a special camera to catch poachers, plus... Morning, everyone. County Terrorism Police are investigating the discovery of material contaminated with uranium at London's Heathrow Airport. The undeclared material arrived on a flight from Oman and was reportedly destined for Iranian nationals here in the UK. Police are working urgently to trace everyone who was involved in the shipment. What on earth has been going on there? Let's find out more, should we? Aisha standing by for us at Heathrow this morning. Tell us what you know. We know that this package arrived at Heathrow on the 29th of December. According to The Sun, uh, it was on a flight that had arrived into Terminal 4 from Oman uh, and that it was in the hold of a passenger jet. Uh, the report details that the package was found after specialist scanners detected it whilst it was on the way uh, to a freight shed and that the, it's believed the package originated from Pakistan. Now, the Home Office hasn't commented. However, there has been a statement released from the Metropolitan Police. And in that statement, Commander Richard Smith has said, I want to assure the public that the amount of contaminated material was extremely small and has been assessed by experts as posing no threat to the public. Although our investigation remains ongoing from our inquiry so far, it does not appear to be linked to any direct threat. As the public would expect, however, we will continue continue to follow up on all available lines of inquiry to ensure that this is definitely the case. So understandably, something like this would cause concern, but I think the important takeaways and reassurances from that message from the Metropolitan Police are the fact that it was a very small amount of uranium detected in this package, that it isn't linked to any known threat, and that it's believed that it will not pose any danger to the public. OK, for now, thanks very much indeed. Some breaking news just reaching us here at Sky Centre. Uh, via the Reuters news agency, we're hearing that a man has injured several people with a weapon in the Paris Gare du Nord station. Um, the suspect, we're told, has been neutralised by the police, shot dead, I'm guessing. Uh, that, according to the France Bleu media station, um, several people injured. We have no idea at this stage as to what level of injury, but it has happened this morning, um, neutralised by the police. We'll get more information on that and we will update you as soon as we, we can on that uh, unfolding story here on Sky News this morning. Meantime, people in England and Wales are being urged only to call an ambulance if a life is at risk. For anything less, use your GP, call the NHS 111 service or visit a pharmacy. That's because around 25,000 paramedics, ambulance drivers and call centre handlers are on strike today and NHS bosses are warning that the service will struggle to cope. Uh, let's get more, should we, with Fraser, who's standing by for us at an ambulance depot in Huddersfield this morning. Hi, Fraser, tell us more. 
Good morning, Kay. Yeah, well, the strike started uh, just after midnight uh, here in uh, Huddersfield and across uh, much of England and into Wales as well. Still quite a bit of support from passing motorists, hearing a lot of horns being blown as they drive past the, the picket line here. But we're here again, aren't we? A sense of deja vu. We had strikes in the ambulance service just before Christmas, something that we hadn't seen in a generation. And still the talks are stumbling. I can have a chat now with Peter Davis from the GMB union, one of the unions on strike here today in West Yorkshire. So there were some talks on Monday, no progress though. Well, there was no progress. I mean, it was a... I think those talks were more for show for the public than they were for us. We got absolutely nothing out of those talks. There were no promises. It was just the government trying to kick the can down the road to a later date. They talked about a future pay rise perhaps being brought forward. That was the headline in the media, but there was nothing solid on the table. We've got a government who, on the face of it, are telling the public that they're talking to us and they want to resolve this. But in reality, the door's not open and there have just been, there's been no, nothing that's come to the table. So we're hearing about different levels of cover that have been offered in different areas. Category one are covered right across the strike areas. Those are the most serious, life-threatening situations. Category two, that's still a little bit unsure, isn't it? It could include heart attacks and strokes. No guarantee that an ambulance will turn out. How do you determine what's going to happen? Well, the managers determine whether it is life or limb, and we trust the managers to send our members out on life and limb calls. We're not here to endanger the public. We're here to highlight the fact that, you know, these workers and the NHS, ambulance service in particular, is on its knees. There doesn't seem to be a day go by when we're not switching the TV on or opening the paper and seeing queues and queues of ambulances. And I've been talking to some of these workers on this picket line today, you know, who are getting really, you know, really angry about what's happening to their service. We've got, you know, depending on which figures you look at, there are around 150,000 vacancies in, in the NHS. This crisis, this, this winter crisis that the government keep telling us we're facing isn't a really a winter crisis. Talk to these workers. This crisis is an ongoing crisis throughout the year and it gets worse and worse every winter. We've got a workforce that are on their knees and these workers are just out there to get them. And you'll, you, you can hear we've got massive public support and, and you know, they're here to, to fight for an NHS, which is, which is crumbling. Kay's going to be talking to the health secretary shortly. What would you say to him directly if you could? Well, I'd say get serious. You know, we want to resolve this dispute. You know, go, go in, coming out with, with ideas about changing legislation to take the workers' rights away from them to do this is not the answer. That would, that's just going to, you know, infuriate our members further. We want the government to get round the table, get serious, negotiate with us, and let's get a settlement and let's get these workers back to work. Thanks very much. I'll let you get back to the brazier, get warmed up. A little bit chilly here in Huddersfield this morning. So there you are, Kay. The message uh, from the picket line here to the health secretary, get serious. Heard that loud and clear. Be putting that to Steve Barclay very shortly. Thanks very much, Fraser. Thank you. Uh, the strikes are set to continue throughout the month. Should we look at them in uh, more detail? Today's ambulance strike will be followed by another in Wales on the 19th and more strikes in England and Wales the following week. Uh, remember, colour-coded here gives you an idea of what's going on. Nurses in England plan to be back on the picket lines on the 18th and the 19th. Rail workers on London's Elizabeth Line, they'll be on strike uh, tomorrow, that's the red one, there you go. And bus drivers in some parts of the capital are striking for six more days this month. Work at the Environment Agency will take industrial action for the first time in the organisation's history. That's on the 18th of this month. And teachers across Scotland will walk out today with regional Scottish strikes from the 16th onwards. That is the... Um, what we call that fuchsia? I'm going to call that fuchsia this morning. Let's take a look at how the papers are reporting the NHS crisis, should we? The Times reads, a thousand excess deaths each week as the NHS buckles. The Express headline has a warning from nurses to the PM that the clock is ticking to do a deal. The Metro describes proposed government legislation designed to limit the effects of industrial action as a strike against strikes. That's the Metro for you. And the I reports six million workers face new strike ban as ambulance staff walk out. Also, the Guardian hears that in response, unions are planning a coordinated day of action. Daily Mail there for you as well.
In other news for you this morning, Prince Harry has said military veterans should be able to talk without shame about their experiences. Speaking in a TV interview, he blamed the press for taking comments in his new book, revealing he killed 25 Taliban fighters in Afghanistan out of context. That's without doubt, the most dangerous lie that they have told is that I somehow boasted about the number of people that I killed in Afghanistan. I've, I've read that section of the book, and I'm, without reading the entire thing right here, it, it is, it, to me, it's, it's a very thoughtful description of what that knowledge is like to have and what the experience is to know that you have done this in order to protect what you believe is good in the world mm -hmm. from those who would wish to destroy it. There's, there's nothing boastful about it. Um, and not but, only but that... Way, but, but also, I would say that if I heard anybody else if I heard anyone boasting about that kind, kind of thing, mm -hmm. I would be angry. But, but it's a lie. And hopefully, now that the book is out, people will be able to see the context. And it is. It's, it's, really, it's really troubling and very disturbing that they can get away with it. And also because they had the context. It wasn't, like a, it wasn't like, here's just one line. They had the whole section. They ripped it away and just said, here it is. He's boasting on this. When... Laura is... Um... With us this morning. Um, so, how was it taken out of context that he killed 25 people? Well, he said it was the one line the papers, the press, the media took out of his 407 page memoir. They said they stripped away the rest of the information, right? They took the context basically, completely disregarded it, and just reported the fact that he says he killed 25 people. I mean, if you look at some of the other information in there, he does describe uh, the people he killed as chess players within a game, pieces, chess yeah. pieces. Mm. Um, and he, I mean, he does, look, on the one hand, he does explain, look, we had to look at it, that I was doing this for good. But on the other hand, the facts are laid bare and the reaction from really senior military personnel after he revealed that, that specific number was, you shouldn't have done this. You're putting your family potentially at risk. You could even be putting uh, the safety of the Invictus Games in Germany this year at risk. Why would you give so much information? I mean, he obviously explains there that having spent a lot of time with veterans, um, having got to know them, the challenges they face, or having you know, taken part in active service, it's this huge risk of suicide, and he thinks by speaking out it will help that. Um, how does saying how many people you killed on the battlefield um, help others? I think he thinks by talking about things honestly, openly, how it came to that, the mindset you're in when you're in the theatre of war, that, it, that accounts for it. As I say, there's been a lot of comment the other way, especially from people in the military saying, you shouldn't have said it, you went too far with this. Hopefully, potentially, Harry has said everything he's going to say now. We've had the last, this is the last of his interviews. So it feels like we've been talking about this book, these interviews for a very long time now. This is it. He's said his piece. He's obviously angry. He said I, 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 it was been very hurtful and challenging, the fact the memoirs got leaked. Blame the press for that. I would blame the Spanish bookshops, personally, that put it on their shelves last Thursday by mistake. Um, now he's got to go away, get on with what he wants to be doing now. And the Do Royal... we know what that is? He says he wants to carry on the work they're doing with their foundation, championing the causes they want. He's hinted, perhaps, at a return to the Commonwealth in some kind of role. Him and Meghan both had really pr prominent roles within the Commonwealth before and they had to give those up when they left, left their lives, working lives in, in the Royal family. Look, the, the royal family themselves haven't said anything, still haven't said anything. Not expecting them to, I'm guessing. Definitely won't. They'll be out and about later this week. Um, the king will probably expect other senior members of the family out and about, you know, getting on with the job. They'll be hoping that despite, you know, the huge number of grenades Harry has been throwing at them in this book, very, very private moments. I mean, we, we hear such intimate details, don't we? I know you finished the book as well, and it, you, you really do get a, a very behind closed door sense of, of the conversations, of the moments, these private moments. They will be hoping that this will blow away. I mean, it, it's been talked about now non-stop for five days. Whether or not that will happen, who knows? Yeah, and the only remaining question is, will they come to the coronation? We asked that yesterday. We've both now finished the book. What's your 
summation? I still think I still think Harry will be there. I mean, he says we need this reconciliation, that we need some accountability on behalf of his father, on behalf of his brother as well. If that happens, it'll all be private. It won't be leaked to the press. <laughs> as we were saying, how can anything Harry says be treated as confidential, given the amount of information he's now released in his, in his book, in, his, in the interviews? But I think he will be there. He, he will appreciate the moment, the occasion, and certainly the king, I would have thought, will want him there. Mm -hmm. OK, for now, thanks very much indeed. Another challenge actually facing him at the moment is his home. There's been some big problems with flooding in California, particularly the area where he is uh, based. Um, and we've been reflecting on that with Martha Kellner. It's difficult to believe that this is California, a state in the grip of several years of drought, but the rains have arrived with a vengeance. Rivers and creeks bursting their banks, trapping people in their homes and cars. The previously bone dry land cannot cope. The onslaught of water sending mud and rock boulders tumbling towards mountainside towns. Ray is surveying the damage, but didn't bargain for the cement like mud. Got huge rock mountains everywhere. Water just piles up. And when it does, this is where it comes, mm -hmm. given the fact that we've destroyed and polluted our, our environment beyond all belief. Mm -hmm. But human race does what it wants, and Mother Nature will do what she does, whether we like it or not. They're more used to wildfires than floods around here, but some places are experiencing their wettest 10 days for more than a century. At least 16 people have died so far. A five-year-old boy was swept away after his mother's car was trapped in flood water. He is still missing. The entire town of Montecito, home to the super wealthy, including Prince Harry and Meghan, has been evacuated. But not before one of its most famous residents issued a warning. This creek next to our house never flows, ever. Probably about nine feet up. Mother Nature is not happy with us. Major roads across California are blocked. This is sort of impassable at the moment, isn't it? It, it is, yeah. So last night, my wife and myself, we couldn't get home. So. Jason is trying to get through to rescue a neighbour who's been bitten by a dog and needs medical treatment. They're not going to be able to make it across, so she's wondering if she could just have one of the other vehicles drive him across mm -hmm. and then, shoot, my dad might take him to the hospital. Some are seeing the bright side, but with more extreme weather on the way, the worst may yet be to come. Martha Kellner, Sky News, Santa Barbara County. Just want to update you on the breaking news that we brought to you um, just a few moments ago about an incident at the Paris uh, Gardenau um, train station this morning. Um, a man injured several people with a weapon. We believe it was a knife. Now, um, he has subsequently been neutralised by the police, is what we are being told. Um, a statement uh, saying the, from the French authorities, the police would have opened fire against a threatening person who would have injured customers in Garden Nord. The person was subdued, the emergency services intervened and the person evacuated. A security perimeter has been established, but the station continues to operate normally, is the latest that we're hearing, as far as that is concerned. So there has been uh, an incident at the Paris Gare du Nord airport, um, train station, forgive me, this morning. Um, several people have been injured uh, by a man wielding a knife. Um, and as a result of that, he has been neutralised, we're told, by the police. Uh, we'll get more information on that and we will update you, of course, as soon as we can. Meantime, let's uh, bring in the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay. Good morning. It's Good great morning. to see you, as always. Thanks for joining us on the programme, just hearing what's happening there at the Paris Gare du Nord airport, um, keep saying airport train station. How concerned are you about what we've heard about what's happening at Heathrow Airport as well? We heard that there was um, some material that uh, anti-terror police were involved in, and, and I don't know what's happening. Well, I'm obviously uh, learning about this uh, this morning, and clearly there's an investigation underway, and it's right that that looks at all the issues uh, and I'm sure it will report in due course. OK. Um, that's obviously very alarming for a lot of people this morning, but as you say, information still coming in on that. What we can say in other matters, particularly as far as your brief is concerned, 50,000 more deaths in the NHS over the past 12 months. Why is that? 
Well, all countries are, are looking uh, across Europe, uh, facing a, a similar issue is what is the consequence of the pandemic? Clearly, during the pandemic, there will be some patients uh, who delayed treatment, uh, particularly we're seeing some of that play through in uh, pressure on cardiovascular conditions. Uh, be some directly linked, some of those deaths, to COVID itself. Some of it may be indirectly where, for example, someone's waiting for treatment. Uh, we've got a, a challenge in terms of uh, people waiting for operations that we're working very actively to clear. So it's extremely complicated as to what the driver of those excess uh, deaths are. That's something we're looking closely. I'm talking to the chief medical officer. The... How alarmed are you by those numbers? Well, it's clearly concerning, but it's not something that's just affecting us in England. It's something no, I know, but all countries... 50,000 uh... people dead who, who perhaps wouldn't have been otherwise. You must be alarmed by well, that. Well, it's concerning that there are those, but clearly we knew at the time of the pandemic that in order to prevent further deaths, uh, deaths as a result of COVID, we needed to take a whole range uh, of very severe actions and, and those had an impact. Those had an impact in uh, uh, further uh, waits for operations, they had an impact sure. in patients who didn't get treatment at the time. Now we've got a recovery plan in place, we cleared the longest waits, the two-year waits over the summer. We're now focused on the 78-week waits uh, and working on those to get those down. So we've invested more in the autumn statement, an extra £6.6 .6 billion yeah. into the, the NHS the to clear those sure. backlogs. Yeah. But obviously that will take okay. time. The ambulance workers on strike again today. Your colleague Grant Shapp saying striking paramedics are risking lives. Do you agree with him? Well, if there's delays to ambulances, obviously it is concerning in terms of our ability to that, that care. But we've been working with the unions constructively on what cover they will put in place. Uh, I'm very pleased that we have cover from the unions. Are they risking lives by going on strike? Well, it's, it's clearly a, a concern in terms of the impact that it has on patient safety. But we're working constructively with the unions in terms of particularly for life-threatening calls, those most urgent 999 calls. And what we're saying to the public is where there is a genuine life-threatening urgency, the most important Category 1 calls are being covered. But clearly there'll be wider pressure on the ambulance system today. So we're saying to people to be mindful of that, but if they do have a life-threatening condition, the most urgent category one calls are covered today. OK, the GMB union had them on the show just a few moments ago while you were speaking to some of our colleagues at other outlets. And they're saying these talks that you've been holding have been pointless. No, I think even the, if I take uh, Sarah Gorton, who's the, the head of the NHS Staff Council, she said after the talks uh, that I had with them on Monday that there had been progress. I'm seeing the doctors' uh, union today to have discussions with them. We believe, Kay, that the right approach is to have the independent pay review body look at these issues in it's terms of what is... The pay review body is not independent, is but it? But it is independent, and even the opposition... The chair of the independent pay review body is describing is chosen by the Prime Minister, and ministers cho cho choose other people within that pay review body, so it's not independent. Well, even the, the opposition recognise that Labour have said that they themselves support an independent pay review body process. That's something that governments of different colours have had successively for many years. It's able to look at these issues in the round, but we're working constructively with the unions to see what further things that we can do. That's why we had the discussions on Monday, because we want to get the evidence for this coming year's pay review body to reflect the pressures that the system are under and that's what we were discussing with them on Monday. I've told you what the GMB has said this morning, uh, the head of the national lead for Unite saying that you only wanted to talk about productivity. Do you think that NHS workers should work harder to get a pay rise? Well productivity is not about working harder, it's about getting the system as a whole to work better. It's about for example the investment in technology, it's about enabling people who have had training to be focused on what that training is best for rather than for example, many of their frustrations with some of the administration, some of the bureaucracy, some of the things in the system that are not working as they should. And actually, that's common ground with the trade unions. The trade unions say to me, often they are frustrated on behalf of their members with some of the inefficiencies in the system. So it's right that we look at where can we work smarter, better, in a more effective way? What is the right investment in technology? What is the cost of agents? at the moment and can we look at how we bring that down so there are areas we can work together with the trade unions on, on that and use that to make any pay review body settlement more affordable in April. General Secretary of uh, the TUC Paul Novak um, saying that the anti-strike laws that you want to bring in are undemocratic. What, what will happen if workers just ignore these laws and strike anyway? 
Well, they say it's undemocratic, but lots of other European countries have them. Uh, and I don't hear them saying that France what is undemocratic. What do, if, if people don't... Uh, if people ignore... Uh, break the law, basically, and go on strike? Well, firstly, what I'm saying is, is lots of other European countries have these. So when people say it's undemocratic, it is something that they have in France, they have in Italy, they have in Spain. Uh, and I don't think anyone's seriously suggesting these countries are undemocratic. But what we're saying is, if we look at the way the RCN have approached national arrangements for the strikes. They've acted very responsibly, to, to, to be fair to them, in terms of having a national arrangement in place. But as the far challenge as my question is had... concerned, we only have a limited amount of time, yeah. Mr Barclay, as you know. Uh, what will you do if workers break the law and go on strike? Well, it, this is about having a safety net there, as they do in other U European countries, to ensure that there are minimum safety levels, minimum service levels in place. We will debate this in Parliament in terms of how this will apply. We're just looking at ambulances uh, in the first instance in terms of health. People, are they? If they well, break the it, law it's about you're just it's, not going to prosecute them. It's about so the it's behaviour much more of unworkable. the unions. It's about the behaviour of the unions more than uh, individual members. So, for example, there's a marked difference between what we've seen with the RCN, who have had national arrangements in place to guarantee safety, and what we've seen with the ambulance strikes, where even up to midnight last night, I was getting calls in terms of what arrangements would be in place in terms of the local cover, the minimum safety levels that would be in place, because the ambulance uh, unions have refused to do that at a national level. And my concern is patient safety. That is what... No, I understand, but my question is, how will you implement this law? If, if people go on strike and it's against the law, breaking the law, what will you do? Well, as they do in other European countries, it's about having a safety net that applies to the behaviour of the trade unions. But what are you going to do we're going to, we're going to debate this. It will probably take about six months in Parliament for the legislation to pass, so we will scrut this will be scrutinised. We will debate this in Parliament. But it's about saying we want to be in a position to have national minimum safety okay. levels in place, just as they do in France, in Spain, in Italy. Will you accept that the NHS is on its knees on your watch? Well, it's under huge pressure, but that's not just in England. If you look at what the First Minister said on Monday, Scottish hospitals are near completely full. If you look at Wales, more than 50,000 people waiting more than two years for an operation. If you look at my counterpart in France, he said that... But the, the, so what? I mean, it's people occurs. in England who you represent and they, they feel that the NHS is on its knees. Do you acknowledge that? It, the NHS is under huge pressure and I acknowledge that uh, in the House of Commons More than on it's Monday. been previously? Well, more so because of the pandemic, because of the combination of uh, the delayed discharge, the people in hospital who are fit to leave and have been delayed. We recognise that with the extra funding we're putting in place in the autumn statement. On top of that, you've got around 9,000 people, over 9,000 people in hospital with COVID. And then we had this massive surge, as they did across Europe, with flu cases over Christmas, a sevenfold increase uh, compared to November. There's a hundred times more patients in hospital with flu this year compared to last your year. Job? Yes, I've had both. And if I could make one plea to any members who have extended the, the number of people that can have access to the job, and if there's any of your viewers, uh, particularly over 50 or in the cohorts uh, that are at risk who haven't had their vaccination, if we can make a plea, Kay, uh, for them are to Are you looking so. at me? I'm saying anyone, <laughs> anyone, anyone who's not had their, their jab, who is, is watching this, uh, if I could urge them okay. to... OK, well, when I get to 50, I might do it. Oh. Thanks, <laughs> thanks very much. It's good to see you, as always. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks for joining us. Um, let's have a look at these pictures, should we, from Huddersfield as uh, we speak. And uh, the General Secretary of the GMB Union, Rachel Harrison, will be joining us shortly. We've been hearing from the Health Secretary there. He was making his point that he was working until midnight last night to try to avert this strike, which has gone ahead. Um, his colleague, Grant Shapps, the Business Secretary, suggesting to us that lives are put at risk because uh, ambulance workers are on strike this morning. Um, We'll get more on that. We will update you further. Um, Amanda is with us now. Hi, Amanda. Alarming that there's 50,000 extra deaths. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry, Rachel. Forgive me. I didn't look at you <laughs> sitting down. Let me put that to you. 50,000 extra deaths. How much of that do you think could be the responsibility of ambulance workers going on strike? I think what, we, what we're actually seeing is, across the NHS and the ambulance services, day in and day out, our people are suffering, patients are suffering, and that's regularly reported by the Associ Association of Ambulance Chief Executives, who report that patient safety standards are suffering as a result of the crisis that our NHS but is facing. But are lives being put at risk because of these strikes? 
lives are being put at risk every single day. But because of these strikes? No, not because of these strikes. And I think what so you... is Grant Shapps wrong to say that, that they are? I absolutely do disagree with what, what Grant Shapps has said, is because I can guarantee you that GMB local teams and representatives across the country have worked around the clock with local employers to make sure that emergency procedures are in place, on the last strike day, what we actually saw was paramedics, emergency care assistants and others leaving the picket lines to go and attend to emergencies. So our members do not want to put lives at risk. But what they're saying to us is lives are being put at risk every single day, regardless of the strikes. And that is one of the issues. How do you feel that people are being asked not to call an ambulance unless it's life or death today? Well, ambulances are there for emergency cover. And I think that, and, and you know, what, what we saw on the last strike day was a significant reduction in calls to ambulance services because the public are behind our members on this. And what they did, they heeded the warnings and they only called it ambulances in emergencies. So, obviously, people are giving advice. If people are in need of emergency care, what we would say to people is still contact the emergency services. Our members are still there. There are measures in place to make sure that the most immediate of emergencies are dealt with. So if somebody needs an ambulance, contact an ambulance. Where are we with the anti-strike clause? We heard there from the health secretary and he was saying that they work uh, very effectively in other parts of Europe. Well, obviously, there was an announcement made um, in Parliament yesterday. We'll look at the bill in detail as it progresses through the Parliament. We're obviously very anti that and we will campaign against that. I think what I found most shocking about the speech that was made yesterday was um, some mistruths in there about the fact that ambulance um, or our ambulance members didn't put safety measures in place during the last strike which which was incorrect. When you say mistruth you mean lies? Well mistruths it, it wasn't correct it wasn't factual what they said when they referenced that ambulance services had not put minimum um, safety levels in place. We we did. Um, and I suppose what I'd like to question as the bill progresses through Parliament is what is their definition of minimum safety levels? What's yours? It's certainly not what it is currently. You know, we've got 135,000 vacancies um, across the NHS. We are not able to deliver the standards of care that our members want to be able to deliver because of the staffing crisis across the NHS. So I would question, are we operating at safe staffing levels on a day-to-day -day basis, regardless of any legislation that the government wants to put through to take away the right to strike from our members? Uh, we heard there from the Health Secretary again that he was saying that um, he was working until late last night to try to avert the strike. Were you? I work round the clock. Um, what we actually did, um, GMB called off the strike on the 28th of December. We had a second day of action planned. We called that off to give um, our show of support back to the public because we were overwhelmed with their support to us. So we wanted them to en enjoy their Christmas break. But we said to the government, we are here around the clock to, to try and resolve this. Come to us and talk to us. They left it until Monday this week to have those conversations with us. So they're the ones that left it too late. We have been here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, available to meet with the government. Because they've chosen not to talk to us about pay until this week, it, 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 it's on what them it that, that this want? strike action goes ahead. What do you want? We want a genuine offer that what recognise... That it's for the government to make that offer. So when we entered... No, you want to know what your no, but, members would be happy Yeah, but with. when we entered the pay review body process 12 months ago, in good faith, what we asked for at that time was a significant increase in pay, um, a commitment to restoring a decade of lost earnings and an immediate down payment on that, plus a whole retention package that truly values the work that is being done in the NHS. Because without a retention package, Recruitment initi initiatives are pointless because staff are leaving. And what we have to do is invest in the workforce now to make sure that the staff we've got now do not leave and the NHS becomes a place where people want to come and work. But the pay review body has told the government what they think is appropriate and that's what they've offered. Well, the pay review body process was severely delayed again. So, you know, on the 1st of April is the anniversary date for pay for NHS workers. They didn't see that pay award imposed into their pay packets until September and October. Is it backdated? So what we act it was backdated to the 1st of April, but, but what's not being spoken about is that the lowest paid in the NHS, so, so for us in the ambulance service, this is your call handle handlers, it's your patient transport drivers, they had to have a top-up to their wages by NHS employers so that they didn't breach national minimum wage laws. And what we're going to see again this year is exactly the same thing, because the pay review body process will not have been followed through by April. And what we will see again is people fall, fall below the national minimum wage. Mm. That's 
horrendous in the NHS. These are the people that we stood on our doorsteps for and clapped for two years, and now they're the lowest paid in the country. It doesn't look as though the government is budging. I mean, I, I was chatting. I'm sure you heard uh, what, most of what the Health Secretary was saying. It doesn't look as though he's for budging. What are you going to do? Our members will decide. We are a member-led union and we, you know, we will decide what, what action looks like. But our members are not going to back down on this. They have had enough and the strikes will continue as long as this government allows them to. So that's why we're calling on the government to make us an offer that we can take back to our members. They will be the ones that decide if it's sufficient and they will vote with their feet. If this government do not address their concerns now, they will continue to leave the service in their thousands. And that is what we're seeing. OK, it's good to talk to you, Rachel. I know you've got a very busy day. Let us know how you get on Thank when you. you keep trying to speak to the government. It's a shame that we didn't have you both on together. That <laughs> yes. would be quite entertaining, Next wouldn't it? Time. Thank uh, you, Kate. Bear with us one second and somebody will help you out. Thanks very much. Um, as I said, um, these are live pictures uh, from up in Huddersfield this morning where... Uh, Members of the GMB union, um, call handlers and um, ambulance drivers are taking the opportunity to explain to the government how frustrated they are at the pay offer that has been given to them, uh, with no new offer, it would seem, in the pipeline. Amanda is here now, Hello. looking equally as glamorous <laughs> as our lovely friend from the GMB union. Mm -hmm. So, where are we going to go with this? Well, I think what you got there from uh, Rachel Harrison from the GMB was this real sense of the bitterness of it. I mean, it almost feels like industrial relations are at a new low today, I think, after the kind of softer tone we were getting after all those meetings on Monday. The unions are accusing Grant Shapps of mistruths um, over this crucial argument in the anti-strike legislation. Um, he gave the example of ambulance, uh, ambulance workers not being willing to give minimum service guarantees across the whole country, mm -hmm. as the nurses has done, as a kind of key example, a justification for why this anti-strike legislation is needed. He said it's a question of public safety and is, 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 is currently the case in other European countries. But what the unions are saying is that's not true. There were agreements in place in local areas across the country for the most serious calls. Um, and they say it's an outrageous attack on them to suggest that it's their unions who've been putting people's lives at risk. They argue it's the government that means minimum service levels haven't, haven't been reached, um, which, of course, we're seeing with the long delays for treatment in the NHS already. Um, we've heard those shocking figures about the excess death over the past year. We know before Christmas, for example, there were 1,600 excess deaths in just one week. In one week, we know that doctors' unions, for example, um, suggesting that they believe between three and 500 people are dying each week because of delays in receiving emergency care. Those figures are disputed by the NHS and the government. But the very fact we're talking about unions putting lives at risk, the government saying they're trying to defend that, um, I think that shows the bitterness of it all after, on Monday, when we had a bit of a conciliation in the sense of this, uh, at least wages and the, the question of, you know, what money is being offered, that did seem to be at least on the table. I think it was interesting, Steve Barclay, when you were speaking to him earlier, was striking a slightly uh, less confrontational tone, I think, than Grant Shapps. He's been the one in, in the meetings with the, with the health unions. He said that Different he had... characters, though, aren't they? <laughs> well, yes. I mean, he was saying he had been working constructively with the unions to, to try and reach agreements. Yeah. Um, but equally also said, well, I've you know, been up all night you know, trying to, to take calls to make sure we, we, we've got agreements in place where we can. Um, he wouldn't give you a straight answer when you asked what would happen if workers refused uh, to go to they work under this law. new law, which effectively Labour say, well, that means workers would be sacked um, if, if that, that was the case. And that's why they're arguing that it's an attack on workers on the right sure. to strike. OK. So, very complicated. OK. Uh, we've got your take coming up at nine o'clock. Looking forward to that. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Now... All week, Sky News has been launching the Westminster accounts. It's a major project with Tortoise Media, which for the first time details in one place how much MPs are receiving in extra income gifts and donations and from whom. Today, we're talking about the all-party parliamentary groups, also known as APPGs. While they have no official status within Parliament, they still get plenty of money in donations. Here's our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. Whether you're lobbying for a bank, a religion or a nation state, APPGs might not be well known, but they are big business. 
£20 million has been funnelled into them over the course of this parliament alone. Most of that goes on paying for organisers, reports, research, events and trips. And there are plenty of these APPGs to put money into. 753 active groups. That's more of them than there are sitting members of parliament. And these are the ones that are getting the most money. So many different subjects covered here in just the top five. Banking, Christianity, levelling up, tech and artificial intelligence. There's an APPG for every sector and every cause. And this is where the money's coming from. Names you've probably never heard of. But what they say they do is revealing. Of the top ten, six of these companies are registered for lobbying and many others have a clear agenda. Well, you can watch today's full report from Sam on our website and throughout the day here on Sky News. Let's talk about it in more detail, should we? Lord Eric Pickles, the chair of uh, the Parliamentary Advisory Committee on Business Appointments, is with us now. Hello to you, my lord. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. Uh, what sort of problems can arise from uh, close relationships between the government and the private sector? Uh, I don't think it's... A, uh, if we're talking about the FPPGs, this is about... Um... Uh, offering uh, finance to move things uh, uh, together in Parliament and to offer policy. My concern is this is a good way for somebody to influence uh, our Parliament uh, in terms of how they put the reports out. But it's, um, I mean, as, you, as your question suggests, it's, it's a good thing that they do this. But I think that, that we, um, we haven't entirely caught up uh, with the process of scrutinising them. There was a recent uh, select committee that expressed worries, uh, suggested that it should be kind of a gatekeeper. The government's conceded there's a problem. And I think it would be rather nice if we got ahead of the process now uh, and did something about it to avoid future problems. One of the ways around that, I suppose, would be potentially for, member, for the, the House of Commons to be financing these APPGs, they don't often receive any uh, direct financial support from Parliament, do they? So does it matter at this stage if they do get money from lobbying groups if they're not getting it from where perhaps they would initially think that they would? I don't think it matters that they're getting money from lobbying groups. What I think the important thing is, and I think we should take a leave from the, the stuff that you've been doing with Toy Toys, is it's the transparency that's really important. And I think we need to have a, a very clear idea of, um, of who's financing, that they appear on the register uh, in Parliament. But I think we need to have a, a, an understanding of, of, of what their agenda is. And it could be that the majority of these organisations uh, are altruistic and are, are simply wanting to uh, further democracy. I'm not entirely sure whether the House of Commons would find the money to, to give this kind of finance. And I don't think it's a bad thing that... Uh, money comes to support politics outside the state. Should MPs be taking money from foreign governments so that they can travel there? That's always a very difficult uh, uh, question and often it depends on uh, what government. Uh, the United States operates a very good system uh, to familiarise uh, new MPs with the United States. Uh, a number of other countries do that, but there are uh, certain countries in the world that, which you really wouldn't want to take any money from. Any in particular that you'd like to highlight? I don't think I'd, uh, I don't think I'd like to be drawn on that, but I think uh, your viewers can take their common sense on that. I don't think providing we just need to have a greater degree of transparency, and uh, that's why I think what you've been producing has been uh, uh, so important. I mean, I've tried to increase the amount of transparency in my own uh, uh, organisations. There's much more detail out there, and I think if you explain. Um, it doesn't become, uh, it, 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 it's a way of ensuring that what's going on is proper, but it's also ensuring that uh, you can um, avoid uh, uh, conspiracy theories as well. Yeah, I mean, you found yourself um, in, a, in, in a, I was going to say a bit of a pickle, but I'm not going to say that. Um, hey, it won't be the you... first time someone said that to me. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> um, it looked as though you'd potentially fallen foul of the rules, uh, but you were, of course, um, subsequently uh, cleared. There was a, a complaint made against you by a member of the public uh, as far as Oakworth Services Limited was concerned. It, and, it, and, you know, you were perfectly within the rules, but it just goes to show how, how complex it can be to stay on the right side of those rules. 
it is complex, and that's why I, I took the decision when I took on the job of ACAPA that I would remove all paid um, uh, outside interest and that I, I, I wouldn't engage because I didn't think it was wasn't a requirement of the office, but uh, I would have been uncomfortable, I think, uh, doing that if I continued to uh, um, work with other outside organisations. OK, I just wanted to go back on those um, countries, if I may, though. I mean, as, as we're chatting, it, it crossed my mind. We, we know that, for example, the previous um, prime minister, a previous prime minister, we've had quite a few in the last few months, Theresa May, you know, she went to Saudi Arabia. Um, would you say that that was a country that, that perhaps uh, people shouldn't travel to at the moment? And then I was thinking maybe Iran, where do you stand on that? Or North Korea or perhaps even Afghanistan? Serious numbers of members of parliament who can't go to Iran, they've been banned. Uh, I've been banned from uh, from from Russia. People are banned from uh, from China. In Saudi Arabia is um, uh, an ally, and I think every, uh, I think individual members of parliament, or whether they're commons or not, need to be able to justify what they're doing, uh, and that does seem uh, a sensible process. And I'm, I don't think the um, Parliament itself should impinge on what members of Parliament are doing, providing members of Parliament stand up uh, and um, uh, kind of um, can justify um, the, their involvement with uh, travelling to a, another country. Um, another former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, earning an absolute fortune on the um, speaking circuit at the moment. So he seems to be incredibly popular. Um, do you think he should potentially be uh, the next Prime Minister for the Conservatives? Well, um, that's out of my purview. I don't have a vote until it comes to uh, But do you uh, have a view? Uh, yes, I do. I mean, yeah, I'm a um, great admirer of, of Boris, but um, I'm a great admirer of the present Prime Minister. And there is no vacancy. <laughs> we got that. Uh, my Lord, it's good to talk to you as always. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Lovely to talk to you as well. Thank you. Uh, QR code for the Westminster accounts on screen now to use our search tool and discover how much money your MP receives. It's all in the Westminster accounts from Sky News and Tortoise Media. Now, it's a time of year when many people love to go skiing, apparently, but instead of groomed white pistes, many of Europe's most popular mountain resorts are still green. France, Germany, Switzerland and Italy have all recorded record high temperatures this winter, which climate scientists warn could be a sign of things to come. Let's bring in Claire Irving, Shatricia, Head of Travel at The Times and The Sunday Times. Oh, OK, I'll introduce my other guest as well, Jonathan Bamber, Professor of Earth Observation and Glaciology. We'll come to him in a short while, but first let's bring in Claire. Uh, talk to us about what it's like where you are at the moment, Claire. Good morning. Morning. Well, you can see here in Gestad, uh, we have snow. Um, we've had snow for two days, though, so that's quite um, a truncated uh, season. The um, when I'm here at a, a summit, and when many of the guests arrived over the weekend from America, this was completely green, and uh, they were really lucky that um, they <laughs> they awoke on their first morning and actually it had snowed. But um, yeah, I mean, normally, uh, you know, you know, in past ski seasons, you would expect snow from mid December. Um, for that really busy key ski season over the Christmas period, um, for these resorts that just rely on that um, that tourist trade, and for you know skiers who really love the sport and for whom their annual ski holiday has become you know so important. How is it affecting skiing punters more generally? Because you said uh, when they got that, if they'd been there last week, they wouldn't have been able to ski, would they? So what's it doing to the business? Well, I mean, in many ways, ski holidays have been quite one dimensional in that uh, on other holidays, you might go with several activities that you uh, you were looking forward to doing. With skiing, it's very, very focused. You want to get on those slopes and ski down them. So, um, so obviously, it's meaning that um, holiday makers are having to be a lot more flexible. Um, they might want, to, you know, their um, ski resorts are offering things like um, mountain biking and hiking and, you know, walking in these really beautiful surrounds. But of course, that isn't necessarily the adrenaline fix that um, so many skiers want. And of course, it's really expensive to go skiing. So that is a very big blow if you have poured all of your um, or a very significant holiday budget into that um, trip and then you can't do what you went to, 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 to go for. 
What's your advice for anyone who has a holiday booked and has seen some of the pictures that we put it on screen where we can just see green slopes, no snow at all? Um, do they still go? Is there compensation? Do they, can you take out insurance for that? So there are lots of different insurance packages available, but I have to say the ones um, for which you can reclaim your entire holiday are few and far between, um, if at all, uh, in existence. You can claim, um, and you would need to check the, um, the small print very carefully. Firstly, if you're travelling with a tour operator, um, a ski specialist, many of them, including um, tour operators like Crystal, <coughs> have um, a promise that if there's no snow, if the piece are closed in the resort they've sent you to, they will get you to another resort within two hours where there is snow. Of course, those claims are, um, are made or were made before seasons like this where lots of um, resorts are, are suffering. So that, that's the first thing, tour operator. Um, second is, is insurance. Check the fine print. You um, Insurers will pay back for um, days lost skiing, um, but you need to make sure that you um, fulfil all the um, uh, all the criteria. So you ne often need to have it in writing that the piece were closed. Um, there needs to be a certain, um, uh, you know, there needs to be literally no snow for that to happen for many. So be very, very certain what you're signing up to in terms of your tour operator and your um, insurance before you sign on the dotted line, because okay. you could in a ski resort with no skiing and, um, and no form of recompense. OK. Um, Claire, um, thanks very much indeed. It looks beautiful behind you, it has to be said. Thanks very much for joining us. Let's bring in Jonathan Bambashud, Professor of Earth Observation and Glaciology at the University of Bristol and the University of Munich. Hello to you, uh, Professor. Is this going to continue on um, for future years? Is this the norm now, in other words? Um, well, look, if you warm the planet, you melt snow and ice. It's that simple. And um, I mean, one one extreme year is not a sign of uh, a trend. But, you know, we're seeing so many of the extreme, so many of these extremes. We saw unprecedented flooding in Pakistan. Last year was the warmest year on record in Europe and the Arctic. And so, unfortunately, this is this is a trend that's just going to continue. Um what should be, so basically, uh, skiing in the Alps is going to be a thing of the past in the next decade or so? Well, look, actually, the uh, snow conditions above 2,000 metres are still reasonable. And, you know, you can still ski in those areas. Um, but the the snow level, uh, the lower level is just going to go up and up and up. So there'll be glacier skiing um, at high altitude uh, for uh, maybe for decades but you know it's going to become increasingly difficult for ski resorts to make this financially viable and it's exactly what claire said um they're going to have to diversify their offerings because uh it, snow is going to become less sure every season now yeah un said yesterday the ozone layer is starting to heal though so why why is this happening okay so ozone <laughs> Ozone's not the same as, as climate change or, or global warming and global heating. Uh, global heating is due to CO2 emissions, greenhouse gases that we're, we're emitting by burning fossil fuels. That's that's slightly different from ozone. Um, and, you know, we've seen since the Industrial Revolution um, a global temperature increase of about 1.2 degrees, but it, actually it's worse in Europe and and the Arctic. And so things, you know, things are... are, are in a pretty bad state in terms of um, glacier, uh, what's called mass balance. That's how fast the glaciers are melting across Europe and snow cover in the Arctic and um, the Alps. OK, so um, from what you're saying, um, skiing is going to be probably a thing of the past in the next two decades or so. Um, you're going to have to try a lot harder to find places where there's there's sure snow. That's uh, that's the bottom line. I think this is absolutely is a sign of um, things to come. OK, good to talk to you, Professor. Thanks for explaining that to us. Much appreciated. Thank you. A lot of um, snow. If you do want to go, thank you. If you do want to go skiing, apparently there's a lot of snow up in Scotland at the moment, is what we are being told. So um, not always the case. You can't always plan on um, having snow in Scotland, but I am being told that that is the case uh, at the moment. So don't head south, head north 
instead. Whatever you do, stay with us uh, for the next hour because we've got Labour's Bridget Phillipson with us in just a moment. Ambulance workers are on strike. The health secretary says he's doing everything he can to try to sort it out. Is he? Stay tuned and find out.